Right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been doing to design a workflow to map agricultural landscapes in Pacific Island countries. Um, I'm using sort of open source geospatial software to sort of put together this workflow. So it's work that was funded by the Australian government uh, through their Centre for International Agricultural Research. And it was... Oh, sorry. Um, so it was a collaboration with Tonga's Ministry of Agriculture. And they were sort of the primary end users of this workflow. And universities in Australia and the Pacific. A quick bit of geography before we dive in. So um, Tonga is a country in the South Pacific. The inhabited islands sort of span over several hundred um, kilometers, and that's really where most of the cultivation occurs. It's a real mix of sort of smallholder and subsistence operations, and then a few larger commercial farms that are targeting export markets. And agriculture makes up quite a significant proportion of the sort of GDP in the country, and a large proportion of the population are involved in agriculture, even sort of informally or as part of their main source of income. And as these kind of satellite images show, there's kind of a lot of variety in the patterns of agriculture on the landscape. And these are the kind of landscapes that we're trying to sort of generate spatial data sets that represent. So thinking a little bit more about the kind of sort of cropping systems and farm systems that we were trying to create spatial data sets for that could then sort of feed into decision making, policy making, um, add value and more information for landscape management. I guess the overriding characteristic was just the sheer diversity of cropping. So within a single field, you'll have a huge mix of crops, so fruit crops and tree crops. You'll have vegetables, root crops. The patterning of crops is very varied, so a mix of intercropping systems, agroforestry systems. And then between sort of farms, there'll also be quite a bit of variety in what crops are growing, depending upon what other livelihood strategies people are employing, what time they can allocate to, to cultivation. And then between the islands, there's varieties in cropping systems as well. And then these systems are incredibly dynamic. So each season, you'll see a big shift in what crops are grown in fields. And every sort of five to 10 years, you might see quite significant changes in um, the dominant cropping systems, largely in response to sort of market forces where there's demand for a particular crop. So at the moment, carver uh, a crop, um, there's a lot of demand for. So you're seeing huge swathes of cropland converted to sort of carver dominant systems. So we needed a workflow that could be flexible enough to capture this incredible diversity in farming systems and be easy enough to use so you could sort of update your data sets as the cropping systems change. So we used something called the ICT4D method to design the workflow. It's um, a field validated sort of framework and methodology for designing ICT systems and services in contexts where there isn't a tradition or history of using sort of technology. Um, a nice feature of it is it covers sort of the full life cycle of deploying an ICT system. So at the start, we were really trying to understand the context of the end users, the Ministry of Agriculture in Tonga, understanding what needs they might have for um, geospatial data or applications, then beginning to think about what would be the requirements for a software system, and then finally thinking, well, how do you sustainably deploy this system beyond the lifetime of sort of a project that's got a fixed end date? It's also a very sort of collaborative user-centered methodology, so it's sort of based on agile software development methods and then participatory rural appraisal from sort of the development world. And it promote, encourages sort of end users and the developers to sort of work together on like several small iterative projects and kind of tries to create this sort of notion of learning by doing. So this is kind of a, a high level sort of overview of our iterative development journey and shows the sort of successive stages um, that we went through to sort of build up the software system to align with the Ministry of Agriculture's needs. We started off focusing on data collection and trying to understand um, what were the Ministry of Agriculture in Tonga's requirements for data collection apps and um, data collection tools. And we reviewed various different options and different apps. And um, we had a lot of initial success with an app called QField. Um, 
it allowed us to go out and create these quite detailed maps of features on farms um, and represent cropping systems in a lot of detail. The other sort of, I guess, nice feature that Qfield offered us at the start of the project was a lot of the people who would be doing the data collection for the ministry were sort of extension officers. Their um, primary role was sort of um, working with farmers, working with plants, diagnosing what um, kind of like pests might be infecting a crop. They didn't do a lot of work with just spatial data. They didn't use computers a lot in their data day work or at all. So there was a lot of apprehension about, well, whether they could actually like sort of learn to use um, a piece of technology. Um, they didn't have a lot of confidence in, in using it. And within sort of a few hours, they'd all kind of gone out, they'd mapped their farm, and they were sort of like, yeah, really excited by the fact they could see the fields they'd mapped, they could click on them on their phone and tablet, and it really exceeded their expectations of what they'd achieve. So there was a bit of buzz about using Qfield and a lot of excitement about how it could be used in the ministry. So our project sort of moved then on to sort of thinking about, well, how do you scale this up? Um, how do you sort of embed Qfield across the ministry's sort of data collection projects and needs? And once you start generating sort of really neat data sets using Qfield, what tools do we need to sort of take that data and feed it into decision-making processes, make it available to the people that are affecting policy or people who are setting up projects and might want to uh, sort of start some monitoring and evaluation? Um, so this was the uh, workflow that we sort of ended up with. We, as I said, we sort of use Qfield for data collection in the field. We use Qfield Cloud for user and data management and sort of managing projects and sort of syncing data sets coming in from the field. And then um, to support sort of, I guess, non-GIS experts who would be at sort of the central level within the ministry who uh, would be sort of the consumers of data and would be able to use this data to sort of affect change. We built some sort of um, dashboard apps that made it really easy for them to sort of query the Qfield data, extract the information from the data sets coming from the field that are like relevant for them. Um, there's a sort of, over the sort of four to five years we've been working, there's been a big shift from sort of paper-based or conversation-based quite informal data capture through to sort of having sort of data sets in the cloud and, and tools on the ministry's website that they can use to access those data sets. So going into a little bit of detail about the requirements that we identified for in-the-field data collection. So perhaps the most important requirement that we had was the app needed to be easy to use for non-GIS experts. And another sort of alluded to before, we had a lot of success with Qfield here. So Qfield has a map first interface. Um, a fair few people have been exposed to desktop GIS either as students. Um, and so there was a little bit, of, but they hadn't sort of been using that since they sort of had a, like an initial exposure. So there's a little bit of, sort of trepidation about sort of technical interfaces and whether they'd have the time to learn it and add it to already sort of busy work schedules. But we found like the sort of map first Qfield interface, people sort of responded well to, perhaps because they're familiar with Google Maps or other sort of web maps they'd seen. Um, and there's only a couple of buttons on there. So once people sort of um, sort of digitized the feature a couple of times, they sort of learned that and they kind of realized that all there was to it. So you sort of had the users who would be collecting the data sets hooked to that early stage. Um, the other key feature that Qfield offers was this online, offline data collection functionality. Um, and that's really important where you're working on sort of remote Pacific Islands, there's not mobile phone signal. So the ability to sort of shift between online and offline modes of data collection was really, really important. Um, again, the ability to map spatial features on farm is kind of an obvious requirement, but to be able to sort of digitize crop parcels, um, put like points in if you wanted to mark the location of irrigation features um, or the areas where livestock were sort of tethered to. So you could sort of, you had a lot of flexibility in how you could easily capture a lot of um, spatial detail on farms. And then we were using Qfield really to place, replace sort of paper-based surveys, um, your traditional kind of household survey style data collection. So the ability to use um, Qfield to capture non-spatial attribute information and the sort of widgets for entering values into fields in your databases and tools for sort of um, complex form navigation was really important. Um, and this is like actually led to sort of Qfield being used as kind of a general purpose data collection tool now. And a lot of sort of non-spatial surveys, uh, 
they're using QField for. And it's quite nice, you can sort of switch between spatial and non-spatial modes of data collection, but there's sort of one app that supports this across sort of the ministry. And again, that kind of speaks back to everyone's time poor. So having one tool that everyone gets trained on, that everyone can sort of build up some familiarity with using is really important. And then another thing that we sort of heard a lot while working with the ministry was there was lots and lots of error in their old paper-based data collection. Someone collects a survey on paper on an island, then like a month later that's sort of typed up into Excel and then it gets used. And then like already two months out of date, handwriting's illegible, it's like smudged because it's hot and wet. So the fact that QField provides constraints on questions um, or what values you can enter into um, fields in your database was really important. The ability to sort of provide sort of helpful tips to users as to what um, sensible values would be was also useful. And the fact that it's based on a GIS, so lots of fields you could sort of just auto-compute and there didn't need to be any sort of human involvement in that data capture. So once we had QField kind of locked in as an app for data collection in the field, we started thinking about, well, how do we manage users and um, manage data when we've got sort of large projects? So hopefully, like QField Cloud actually met a lot of these requirements for us, which is nice because we sort of settled upon using QField as our initial sort of data collection app. Perhaps QField's Cloud's um, most important feature for us was it supported large team data collection. So we ended up with sort of teams of like 40, 50 people collecting data in the field. And um, yeah, QField Cloud handled that easily. Um, the security features in QField Cloud, so password protected access to data collection projects, you could assign certain users to certain projects was important. As these were like government data sets, you're collecting private information. So that was also an important sort of requirement. And then the low bandwidth data syncing was really important. So we did all of our, all of the data syncing in QField Cloud is kind of automated. So there's no sort of requirement for an analyst to sort of bring these data sets from the field and aggregate them, which was what was being done previously. And this notion of being able to just push changes from your device um, meant that you could sort of just pushed a small log of changes you'd made up to the cloud but you didn't need to sort of sync everyone else's changes back to your device. So when you're working on mobile phone data, limited kind of mobile phone um, connection, that was a really nice feature to be able to sort of back up work in the field. And then QField Cloud's got a really nice API. So where there are features that perhaps QGIS and QField Cloud and QField couldn't necessarily support, we could build custom applications kind of to meet those needs, whether it's accessing data from QField Cloud or doing bits of user and project management. And then finally, there's this deltas part of the QField Cloud API, which is just a record of every change that's made to a project. And the Ministry of Agriculture were quite keen that there was a record of what each surveyor or each data collector had done, monitoring their staff, um, monitoring the progression of projects. So that was also a really nice feature that they liked, the ability to sort of see um, a record of how a project had sort of grown over time and who had made what changes to a project and having that record. Okay, so we've got to a point where we've got QField for data collection in the field, QField Cloud to manage users and the data as, as part of these projects. So the final thing was how do we have, make these data sets have an impact? How do we get them to affect decision making to um, generate learning from sort of monitoring of projects? Um, and we found that it wasn't as easy to sort of train up large numbers of people to use sort of desktop GIS with a slightly more technical user interface as we did with training people up to use QField in the field. So the one thing we did notice is everybody had web browsers on their laptops or computers. So we kind of thought that was a logical place to sort of try and allow people to access the spatial data sets that were being collected in the field. So we, we designed two um, dashboard applications that were built on top of the QField Cloud API using Shiny. Um, Shiny is really nice for, for doing this kind of development. Like we did this very iterative. We'd sort of make a dashboard app very quickly. We'd show it to users, they'd use it, we'd get feedback. And we do this sort of successively in um, maybe like build two or three sort of prototypes in a day. And with Shiny, you get sort of a bootstrap user interface. You get the access to sort of use Leaflet with minimal coding. So you can make quite slick applications um, very quickly, which sort of the users were excited because they saw quite a cool prototype. And you could very quickly get up to sort of um, what would be kind of a final working model. Um, so this first application we built was 
to really provide sort of non-GIS experts the ability to do some simple GIS analysis in a web browser. Um, grab your key field cloud data, drop it onto a web map, uh, a data table or a chart, and it's kind of interactive, you can explore it. And we wrapped some common GIS functions um, that you would say do in a normal spatial database, like group by and summarize, um, joining layers, uh, filtering rows out of a table. So you, a common requirement we had was we had like a sort of a table which had fields all in rows, and they have many variables that described crops and various other farm management practices in that table. Can we just filter out rows, say, where it's just carver and cassava, and grab those rows out of the table, and you've got a new layer that's reflecting a particular cropping system. Um, but all of that was wrapped behind just a simple click, click a single button, and it kind of does that task for you, start user interface. And then the second um, app that we built was really just about sort of publishing and quickly viewing QField Cloud data. So you can publish a QField Cloud data set as it is on a web map. You can use the sort of security features in QField Cloud um, to share that data set with certain stakeholders. So sharing data across ministries with donors, you can provide simple data sets to them um, if they're trying to like design a project. Um, and then that um, dashboard app had like tools that were sort of designed particularly for like query and cropping systems or generating village and district level summaries of um, farm management and farm practices. Um, and then the other part of it was some tools for automated reporting. So Word Docs. So yeah, Word Docs and PowerPoint presentations was the main way that information was disseminated around the ministry. So mini, mini Word Docs short reports were sent from the farm level and sort of field offices up to the central office or their sort of quarterly or annual meetings where PowerPoint presentations were presented. That, that was just the way that information flowed in the ministry. So we kind of had this tool where you can very quickly get to your QField Cloud data. You can say, I'm interested in these villages and these variables, and it sort of just spits out a load of summary tables and charts for you. And then staff could quickly drop that into their Word doc reports or put it onto slides. And then that was a very fast way of, say, people who didn't have like GIS expertise or time to be trained up in GIS could still use this data and get it to the people that um, require it to sort of understand what's going on at the farm level. In terms of deployment, so QField and QField Cloud have um, well-established ways for sort of installing and deploying those apps. That was great for us. We didn't need to do anything there. And for the dashboard apps, we used Docker and Docker Swarm. And then um, some middleware called Shiny Proxy, which handled different users' app instances. So just quickly to talk about some of the impact that this work's had. So we've trained over 100 staff in the Ministry of Agriculture to use tools specific to this workflow or um, just various sort of GIS and um, geospatial tools just to build up a general capacity in working with this kind of um, data and tools. We've mapped over 12,000 farms um, across applications such as their sort of national um, annual crop survey and farm system monitoring and also for sort of quite targeted projects and programs. So. Um, the monitoring for the seeds and seedling distributions to women farmers and kitchen gardeners is now sort of all that monitoring is going on using this workflow. And then there was a big volcanic eruption in Tonga earlier this year, the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapai. Yeah. So all the um, this data sets were used in the initial sort of food security assessment as to where there might be sort of shortfalls in food supply based upon what crops are in the ground that would have been lost. The offline functionality in QField was really important when the under, undersea cable was severed, uh, but people could still go out and use this tool offline to map croplands that were damaged. And then surveys with local community leaders, um, this tool was used for to understand what the ag infrastructure was damaged, what crops were lost, and to um, generate sort of the, the value for the relief payments. And then the other neat thing is that this provides kind of a spatially detailed view of cropping systems that's not really possible with existing data sets and tools. So the best data set previously would be the Ag Census, which gives you sort of village and district level summaries of cropland area. And then finally, just thinking about the sort of sustained deployment of this workflow beyond the lifetime of this project. Um, 
and, and building up the capacity of, of users in the Ministry of Agriculture to keep working with it. So as I said, we've, we've done a lot of training. This has been classroom-based. It's been a lot of online stuff through COVID, lots and lots of field schools. And then we've also trained up a few sort of key users within the ministry who've then gone out and shadowed other workers and sort of been there to support them in using the tools. So I didn't feel like you're sort of, oh, it was like one or two workshops and off you go and you've got to use it. Like we sort of try to make sure there are people there to sort of support them um, as they were using it in their actual sort of activities. And then... I guess hardware was a big barrier at the start of the project. There were certain sort of pinch points in people adopting this workflow due to lack of sort of particular devices or hardware. So we sort of did a lot of work identifying where those hardware gaps would be and then sort of procuring laptops and tablets and mobile phones to sort of try and fulfill, to sort of plug those gaps. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much it for me and very happy to answer any questions.